and uh, thanks everyone for coming. And uh, uh, yeah, it is, it's basically this is the launch of our book. This is the book, and uh, our commissioning editor Jane Sayers from World Scientific is here. So if you fancy to write a book yourself, then go and have a word to Jane. Uh, and she's brought some flyers along, which uh, I'll put down the front. Uh, but the interesting thing about them is that they, it has a code on it, so you can get 25% off the book until the end of the year, which given Christmas obviously is there as, a, as an issue. Um, I would imagine that a lot you could think of a lot of people who would like such a book as a Christmas present. So I'll just put those there. Um, it's Rod, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I, when you walked in, I wasn't sure. So uh, it's hard to come back, you, you know. Right. Yeah, I got a bit away. T this uh, twenty years ago, twenty years ago, right now, I was the head of the School of Ag and Resource Economics here, well, and. No, uh, it, over a long period, but today was an important day 20 years ago because it's my mum's birthday this week, so I would have been thinking about going to see her. But the thing is that, yeah, I was head of the school 20 years ago. Dave here, who you all think of as a god now, he was just a little boy in shorts <laughs> and, um, and who, you know, I mean, talk about, I mean, I didn't, I wasn't directly the supervisor of his PhD, but I basically was the one who wrote most of it. And... Um, <laughs> And if you, look at, uh, if, you, if you look at his biography, autobiography, when he writes it, you'll see I'm in there, basically, as the person who made him what he is today. Um, I also, uh, at that very time, I was the, one of the PhDs I was supervising was Dave Cook's PhD. Dave's here as a co-author, but then he was even in shorter shorts than Dave Panel was. And so he, I, I, when, I, I, when I finished my own... PhD, I thought, well, that's the end of it, but no, I had to write Dave's as well. So there's two people in the room whose PhDs are lousy due to me. Um, how much longer have I got, Maxim? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so it's a real treat to come back and talk to people uh, at this place because my memories are so long and important of this place. But the interesting thing is that I've learned by painful experience that if I'm just the only one talking, people don't come. Okay, so there would have been nobody in this room apart from poor old Maxim if it was just Rob Fraser. So what I've learned over the years is to bring along co-presenters, usually one of each gender and good looking ones at that, so that I can then say a few stupid things at the start and then pass over the, pretty much the whole thing to them, which is exactly what I'm going to do now. Um, so this book is with this uh, Janet who, um, and Dave, and the book's been written in, in a set, in, with a structure which will you'll see, see how that flows. If I press the next slide, we have, um, uh, well, you, you can all read, and in brackets, you'll see the names of people, so you'll see how we will in turn appear on the stage here presenting our work. So I don't think I need to do any more at this season. Hand it over to you, Janet. Thank you. Thank you. Do you need that microphone? Do we uh, I think I have to give it over to you now. Do we need the microphone? It's being recorded, apparently. Nice. There'll be a video, and we have David will sing on it, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, thank you for. I think thank you for that, Rob. Um, I'm Janet. Uh, I'm, I'm Rob's wife. Um, but the, let me just explain a bit how this book came about. Um, I finished my PhD about 20 years ago, and my PhD was in international trade and the environment, looking at the World Trade Organization, the GATT, and how they handled environmental-related disputes, ecosystem services disputes. And um, the first part of the book is really um, a synthesis of, of that, that um, argument that the World Trade Organization was deficient in how it dealt with um, these sort of disputes. And um, I did my PhD. That work got put aside, and I went on to do other work now in sustainability. And about three years ago, Rob and I were out walking, and I'd just finished another book, wondering what to do with myself, and um, said, oh, well, you know, I was talking about my PhD, and he said, well, Dave Cook and I have written extensively about um, 
economic models and using economics to try and work out how to make better decisions in, um, in trade disputes relating to ecosystem services and biosecurity. So that's how the book came about because we suddenly realised there's this sweet spot where we'd both been working at different times but never brought it together in a book. So the first part is really is, is work for, that I did originally 20 years ago and an argument made 20 years ago about the um, defectiveness of the World Trade Organization and how it looks at the, uh, making decisions on um, ecosystem services, but now biosecurity as well. And then Dave will, and Rob will present the, the hard stuff that's the economics. Okay, if we look at the um, objectives of the World Trade Organization, or the GATT as it was, uh, which formed post-Second World War, um, it was brought about as a way of um, intending to try and maximize economic welfare through le least trade uh, restrictiveness. That's what it's trying to do. It's saying, if we have trade barriers, then it's some form of market failure because um, things don't work as well. And so what we're seeing in the world now with increases in tariffs between the US and China, a very anti-World Trade Organization. And um, between, um, particularly from the 1980s onwards, they started to look at how they dealt with um, more complicated things beyond tariffs, which they called non-tariff barriers. And this is where we started to see the environment coming in as an as a, um, attempted legitimate reason to have a trade barrier. Um, so that was coming through the GATT. In the mid-1990s, the World Trade Organization was formed, which had a greater jurisdiction and greater, greater authority in trade than the, the GATT, which had been a sort of pleasant agreement and sort of thing. This had more basis in law. But they did something quite interesting because actually they also, this is from the preamble of the objectives of the World Trade Organization. This is 1995. They actually um, used the term sustainable development, which was a term that was really only beginning to get known in the, in the, mid to early, in the early to mid 1990s at all. But this is really important. They wanted within their disputes and their trading systems through this least trade restrictiveness to allow for the optimal use of the world's resources in accordance with the objectives of sustainable development, which they then went on to talk about Brundtland and the sweet spot between economic, social and environmental sustainability. And they recognised by doing so, this would, um, this would maximise economic welfare. So that was their intent, that was their objectives. How they did it was quite interesting, and um, my argument in my PhD was actually it doesn't meet the, the way they make decisions doesn't meet those objectives, because the original um, way the GATT looked at it, and this is still relevant for ecosystem services now in the World Trade Organization, is they did it through lawyers. They did it through a dispute um, settlement system where they applied articles, rules, rules-based decision making. And any ecosystem services case and some biosecurity ones have used basically these two exceptions, Article 20 general exceptions, where they can apply this as a way of overriding most of the main rules within the GATT or the World Trade Organization. Uh, Article 20B was necessary to protect human, animal or plant life or health. And Article 20G relates to the conservation of exhaustible natural resources. If such measures are, you can all read that. So these can't be unjustifiable, they can't be arbitrary, and um, there have been quite a few disputes in ecosystem services, there have been about 12 of them, where these rules have been applied to see whether um, you know, the US can stop uh, Mexico um, using purse seine nets to um, fish tuna, or uh, we, I'll talk about the cases in a minute. So that was the first rule. The World Trade Organization brought in some um, additional rules, and the ones that have been used particularly for biosecurity are the sanitary and phytosanitary standards, Articles 5 and 2. There are others that are in there as well. But the fundamentals that this brought into place were two things. One was the use of risk assessments um, as a way of evaluating the impact of um, some sort of measure. So uh, looking at the risks to human, animal or plant life or health. Um, so um, risk assessment techniques, ones that are um, recognized by relevant international organizations. So it starts to allow the use of data to come into decision making uh, rather than just the lawyers arguing about what these rules mean. 
There's also uh, Article 2, which said it's got to be based on scientific principles and scientific evidence. So what we saw with the World Trade Organization was a move away from just the lawyers using these two rules to start saying, actually, let's use some data here to try and get behind what's happening in, in this dispute uh, to try and work out the optimal resolution to maximize economic welfare um, for the benefit, through least trade uh, restrictiveness. Um, what we did in the book, uh, we then looked at the, um, what, what cases have actually happened. And we've done it through looking at the biosecurity cases first and then the ecosystem services cases. And um, since 1995, there have actually only been six completed cases through the settlement system. There have been a lot more than that. A lot have either just sort of fallen off their list somehow and nobody's bothered to resolve them, or they resolved without going to dispute settlement, or they, um, yeah, or they, yeah, they just got dealt with, or there are many in process that haven't completed yet as well. But within this book, we looked at these six um, that range from 1995 to um, the most recent finished one is 2014. These are, there's more in process, but these can take two or three years to actually resolve. And then they might go to an uh, appeal board and take another couple of years to try and resolve. So these take a long time to resolve. And we looked at each of these cases to see how decisions had been made and how the, um, those rules that I gave you and the SPS had been applied. And uh, within the book, we've concentrated on particular cases, concentrated on, um, I think it's the first two, isn't it? Yeah, it's the ones in it's the, um, it's the salmon one and an apples one as well. Can't read it from here. This, yes, it's, it's DS367 and DS18 we've concentrated on. In terms of evaluating it through the economic model, we're going to be explaining to you. Um, within the, val um, the biosecurity case, we said, well, actually, what's good and what's bad about these? And we found that there was p their patterns emerging. Lawyers like the idea of precedent, and so they look in each case to learn from the case before. And there were certain patterns that came through through precedent. The first was uh, relationships um, and looking at what international standards on biosecurity <coughs> they're happy to accept within the SPS. Uh, they have started to develop what they think of as what do we mean by acceptable risk assessment, but these cases can run to hundreds and hundreds of pages of argument about what this means uh, before they decide to actually move it forward. It's a bit like something in Britain that's going on at the moment called Brexit, which seems to move very slowly. Um, they've actually become clear about what they mean by expertise and who can be experts um, to come into the panel to bring this data to bear. Um, and that what they mean by academic credentials and the scope of what they can comment on. And they've also under begin to understand what they mean by the term necessary, um, which is, you know, is this really necessary for protection, biosecurity protection or is it a disguised restriction on trade? And the term necessary gets, uh, has got argued about for probably about 40 years now. But they're beginning to understand what they mean by it and have definitions behind that. So we are seeing in the biosecurity cases a lot of data, a lot of information is being brought to bear in those cases to help decide what the resolution should be to the disputes. Uh, within the SPS rules, uh, they also um, want the panels to take account of relevant economic and trade factors, uh, but they don't. Every case is based on science, 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 law, science, law, and science. There's very little, um, there's some uh, um, economic trade data occasionally, but it never appears as part of any discussion on how to resolve the dispute. It's, ne it's never material in terms of what they, um, what, how they make the decisions. In terms of the ecosystem services cases, uh, my PhD was just ecosystem services cases because um, the World Trade Organization only came into fruition just as I was writing up. Um, and since the early 1980s, there's been 12 of these cases. Um, we're going to be concentrating on um, tuna dolphin and retreaded ties, and Dave will talk more about those cases as well. Until... Um, until Venezuela, until here, all of those were dealt with through the GATT, 
through Article 20, and subsequent to that, they were the World Trade Organization. But they still only have been dealt with through Article 20, um, B and G. But there's still not been that many of them. And most of them seem to have involved the United States as well. Okay, throughout this period, um, there has been some movement forward uh, by the lawyers. Uh, some precedents and common understanding has occurred of what would get through and what would be resolved and, and what would be um, overturned and things like that. So the definition of what they mean by necessary and relating to, remember those two articles that they apply. There's been a lot of lawyers discussing what those mean and they're beginning to understand what they mean. They also have come to a common understanding of what exhaustible natural resource means and what it doesn't and what's within scope and what isn't. Um, and they've also um, had some thought about geographical scope. It's called extraterritoriality. It's whether a country can um, stop a third country taking particular measures um, that they believe are anti-environmental. So is it legitimate for the US to stop Mexico um, fishing for tuna the way it wants to? It's a different country. Are they allowed to do that? Is it legitimate? Um, as part of this, we did look at um, what sort of data was used. And in this case, we sort of, is any trade or economic data being looked at? Have any social implications been looked at? Has any environment, have any environmental um, impacts been looked at? Um, over time, we found there was an increasing evidence base there. People were bringing data to bear in all those areas. But to date, none of it's actually been used as any part of the panel trying to make a decision. So we have started to see it being used. Um, I'll, I won't put that next table up. Um, now, there are clearly limitations to this pro approach, particularly if you're not a lawyer, and particularly if you're an economist, because you're thinking, well, you can't use law to make a decision on something where the objectives are fundamentally ones where you're trying to balance economic, social, and environmental attributes for maximization of economic welfare. You can't just apply some words to that and expect the lawyers to sort it out. So I think there's a core problem using this rules-based approach. And, you know, in actuality, looking at the cases, little regard has actually been given to the trade and economic impacts of the dispute. When you read all the texts, the hundreds of pages, it's arguing about the interpretation of those rules and the words that are used, not the impact and what the actual dispute's about. So you could find lawyers interpreting the rules in a particular way that has a negative impact in terms of trade, environment, economy. Uh, particularly no considerations given to consumer gains from trade. So we don't, you know, they're, they're making decisions without understanding what the impact of those decisions are going to be on the very thing they're meant to be making a decision about. So it's a perverse, um, perverse thing to do. And you know, the, the lack of data means that these dispute panels are making decisions with only partial factual information. They don't have the information to bear to make informed decisions. And even when there is data, it's not, it's not a complete set of data. Uh, there might be bits here and there, but they've not actually said, what's happening here? Can we find a structured model and a way of understanding what's going on to make a uh, decision for um, economic, maximizing economic welfare? And we believe, and this book's all about um, trying to find a means of doing exactly um, that, is finding a way, how can we model this? Um, and um, Rob and Dave will now present this very model because we want to see well, actually what's the impact on this situation of this trade dispute or lifting this trade dispute, whether it's in uh, biosecurity or ecosystem services. So we're trying to widen the scope of what's considered relevant beyond those little legal rules, but also by looking at quantification and qualification of the facts, um, hopefully we'll be able to start looking at uh, the impact to optimize the decision that it will be made. And I'm now going to hand over to somebody. Hey. I'm sorry, it's Rob again. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're now moving into the the analysis of these impacts. So basically, it's a um, cost-benefit framework. So we look at the impacts of the trade and look at the beneficial impacts and the costs of those of the trades. And uh, the, the way it's set up, we're looking part B, which is next, at biosecurity. So what we're looking at there 
is a situation where the trade will have uh, impacts on consumer and producer surplus, so the normal gains from trade type issues. But then in addition, the risk of, a, uh, uh, of damage being done to the importing country uh, from these new, this new trade. So the, the idea that when uh, you bring something in and that carries with it a disease that then has a negative impact on the domestic production uh, in that country. And so we, um, the way it's done is Dave has a, a bioeconomic model that analyzes both the gains from trade and these biosecurity impacts. Um, and I'm just going to do a quick diagrammatic version of that. And so we'll do this for uh, biosecurity and then we'll do it for ecosystem services. So the, the, the idea here is that this diagram is just a static representation of what you would normally be thinking about when you're looking at the impact of a new trade. So the, um, basically, if you, this is the situation here. Uh, of the original, the, the basic supply curve of the, for the importing country, and this is the uh, demand curve. And the gains from trade are, this is a world price, but we're assuming there's some costs of importing or a, a, a protection cost in there, so that in the end, the domestic price drops from P0 to P star. So the gains from trade are these triangles here. Um, there are, is an equivalent triangle set up in the exporting country, but I'm not going to get into that right now. We do talk about that in the book. So that's the standard gains and trade situation. But then we have, in addition to that, this risk factor. And so the, 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 the idea of representing the extra supply curve is this is the supply curve if you then get an outbreak of disease in the importing country, which damages their domestic production of the same good. And that uh, involves a big change in uh, uh, producer surplus. In the situation here, you get um, you get a, you get uh, I can't remember the exact amount of the rectangle here, but we're going to lose a lot of, cons of producer surplus. But it is with a, uh, only a probability. So in Dave's analysis of these cases that we've chosen, we'll be looking at comparing the gains from trade with a expected impact on the domestic industry. So there'll be a big area, but with a probability out the front of it, whereas this is meant to be more of a known entity. So there's a, a benefit aspect and a cost aspect that we'll look at in these two case studies. And basically what we'll, Dave will do now is talk about those two case studies, and then we'll, I'll come back and do the ecosystem services one. So. Thanks, Rob, and uh, thanks very much, everyone, for, for coming along. Um, so, yeah, the, the two case studies um, we'll be presenting here. The first one is um, New Zealand apples imported to Australia. Rob and I have sort of published on this uh, 2009, thereabouts, Australian Journal of Ag Econ. I thought it was a bit later than that. Was it? Because it took about three years to get through. Yeah, that's three, right. Three. Three lots. <laughs> um, so we just sort of, as Rob said, we had the model there, so we've just sort of rejigged it. So just by way of a bit of... Um, background. So apples were banned, uh, apple imports were banned from Australia, uh, from New Zealand uh, after the discovery of a disease called fire blight, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, in 1921. So um, New Zealand made repeated market access requests, so 89 and 95, both of those were rejected um, by way of an import risk assessment by the Australian Quarantine and Inspection Service. Um, they again sought market access in uh, 1999. Um, the IRA was initially uh, positive, uh, saying that if certain uh, trade measures were abided by, yes, New Zealand apples could come in, and they represented a risk that was below our appropriate level of protection. However, that was only the draft. I think that was 2005 when the final one uh, came out in 2006. There were even more stringent SBS measures uh, sort of put in place. So um, New Zealand took exception to that and uh, in 2007 requested consultations uh, with, with Australia. The panel ruled 
in favour of New Zealand that the, the ban uh, wasn't the least restrictive uh, means of protecting itself that it could take, Australia unsuccessfully appealed the, the decision. So the WTO erred on the side of, of trade. So the problem, there were various pests and diseases identified, but the main one was, was five light, so this, this bacterial uh, disease that I mentioned. Uh, it was originally discovered in the US. It's since spread to uh, virtually every apple producing region in the world, with the exception of Australia. Uh, as, as I mentioned in the 1920s, it reached um, New Zealand. So why is it a problem it's, um, if, it's, if it's endemic throughout most of the uh, production, <coughs> excuse me, production regions? Uh, basically, it's a, a cost issue. So it causes severe uh, yield losses, and it will actually cause tree death if it's un untreated. Uh, however, it is controllable, so um, prior to infection you can uh, spray uh, copper. There are antibiotics uh, that are available. Once it's in your orchard, you can adopt a, an aggressive sort of pruning regime, sort of get rid of the, the limbs that are infected. Um, but all this costs you a lot of money. So our estimates um, around about you know, $1,400 per hectare. And when your profit margin is something like 3000 it's you know, almost halving your, your profit margin should it get into Australia. And the other thing to note about it, it's easily spread. So once it's, it's got in, virtually impossible to eradicate it. It's spread by honeybees um, as well as rain splash. So just to give you an idea, um, the name fire blight comes from this um, blackening, uh, in this case, of the, the buds, but it also affects the limbs as well. You can see a severely affected uh, tree there. Um, fruit is, is also affected, and you get these cankers that are on the, um, on the, on the trunks that um, sort of emit this bacterial uh, ooze, uh, which again is sort of highly infectious. So uh, not a nice disease. If you can avoid it, um, it's, it's probably best to do that. So running through the numbers, um, so what we're doing here, we're, we can, we're looking at the, the gains from trade um, that uh, the, the WTO, so in, in allowing the trade, what, what gains from trade does um, Australia uh, get out of importing the, the apples and comparing that to the increase in producer risk because we're importing the apples. I should have mentioned we have actually had a case of fire blight. So even though we don't, we hadn't imported apples, I think it was in the 1980s, we had an outbreak of it in the um, botanical gardens. So just because imports uh, might be zero, it doesn't mean the probability of entry and establishment is actually zero. Um, so anyway, we're comparing the gains from trade with the expected increase in producer uh, produce a surplus loss as a result of the of fire blight. And I won't go through the bioeconomic models, I'll invite you to, to look at the, uh, the, the book for that. So gains from trade, we're, um, we're assuming that the landed price of New Zealand apples will be uh, quite a bit below uh, Australia's um, domestic um, price. We don't have the most efficient uh, apple producers uh, in the world. We estimate that um, the, the gains from trade are around about 15.6 million. Um, when we compare that to the increase in producer risk as a result of fire blight, uh, and I'll show you a little bit more about how we, we evaluated that over time, um, the, the difference, um, uh, so the, the increase in um, producer risk is more like uh, 23.8 million. So the increased risk is above and beyond the gains from trade according to our assessment. But of course when you're dealing with um, bioeconomic models um, with pests and diseases that sort of spread over time, it really depends on what kind of time frame you're looking at. So um, what we have here is just a, a temporal axis, so on the, on the x-axis the y sort of shows the, the change in sort of social welfare. Um, I'll draw your attention to, so we've, we've got um, the gains from trade, the grey bars, the change in expected impact which are the hollow bars, and then the net uh, change in, in social welfare, which are the black bars, and they're, they're the ones I want you to concentrate on. So it really depends on what kind of time frame we're looking at as to whether trade gives you a positive or negative result. You know, in the first sort of 10 years, it looks overwhelmingly positive and thereafter uh, negative. So the time frame is really critical. We talk a little bit about this in the book, and we simply decided uh, 30 years by working with, with growers what's a relevant time frame to look at these um, decisions, but the jury's sort of still out on that. Sorry, just clarification on that picture. Are these numbers discounted? Which is That's right, yes, yeah, sorry. We used a discount rate of 5%, I think it was. Might have been higher, might have been 7%. Uh, yeah, there's some sensitivity of that too. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So, yeah, so what I'm presenting is just the mean values uh, here as well. Again, in the book, we sort of talk about the full range of uncertainty. Um, so, 
Moving on uh, quickly in the interest of, um, of time, so the second case study we're looking at is the uh, Canadian salmon, uh, one again involving Australia. So salmon imports uh, to Australia uh, had been banned uh, in the 20 years post-1975. Now that's all sort of fish imports, not, not just salmon. Um, Canada made a market access request in the early 1990s. A import risk assessment was, was um, released in 1995. Uh, saying that they, that the imports, um, this is a draft IRA, that the imports presented a negligible risk. Once again, when the final one sort of came out, a year later, 20 different pests and diseases were, uh, were named, one of the most prominent of which was whirling disease, which again, I'll, in, the, in the same as the last case, we just use that as the case study to look at, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go along. So. Um, Canada took exception to that uh, in 1997, requested consultations. The panel ruled uh, in favour of, of Canada. So once again, promoting uh, trade and Australia's uh, succeal, uh, appeal was unsuccessful. So the, the main pest that people <coughs> were worried about was this whirling disease. So it's a, a um, parasitic disease of salmonids. Uh, so rainbow trout and Atlantic salmon. Um, in our case, are, are severely affected. Uh, it's an interesting disease because it has multiple, or it has a two-host um, life cycle uh, involving these um, bottom-dwelling uh, worms as well, so which are everywhere. So it's not a case of controlling the, um, the intermediate host. Um, it affects juvenile fish, uh, not so much adults, and the, when they, they are infected, they sort of swim around in a circular fashion and basically wear themselves out. So hence the, the term whirling disease. So why is it a problem? Um, it causes exhaustion, malnutrition, and, and basically a yield loss uh, to salmon producers. Um, it can't be eradicated once it's introduced into a waterway. Uh, as I say, those intermediate hosts are, are sort of everywhere. Uh, it can be controlled though. So in North America, it's a case of taking your, um, your fingerlings, your small plot, the, the juvenile fish, um, taking them to grow out facilities. So constructing the grow-out facilities and filtering the water, treating it with, um, with an irradiation um, device. So which can add, um, the, the research we sort of looked at, you know, $155,000 a year, so it's not a trivial amount, but you can sort of live with it. So this is a picture of the disease, little alien sort of looking thing, the little tube effects worms, uh, which again are, are sort of everywhere, so you can't sort of control them. Um, so. The, the impacts on, on this sort of juvenile fish, you can see the kink in the, in the tail there, and that's sort of more obvious in these little um, finglings as well. So once again, quite a nasty disease. So running through the numbers, in terms of the, uh, the gains from trade, so uh, what happens if we, if we do re um, relax the ban in Australia? What do we get out of it in terms of gains from trade? We're talking sort of pretty small numbers, so around about 3.1. Uh, million dollars. So the landed price of Canadian salmon isn't it hugely um, below the domestic um, price. Um, so it seems low until you sort of look at, you compare that to the increase in the expected damage resulting from whirling disease. And here we've sort of estimated, you know, at, at best it's, you know, $200,000 a year simply because the probability of entry and establishment is so low. So again, we're talking about quarantine restricted trade. Um, most of, the, of those involve um, a heat treatment of some description, so cooked salmon sort of coming in represents such a low level of risk. Um, so it's, it's quite a bit below the um, expected gains from trade, um, if you believe the, the numbers that are in the IRA. So and once again, just to be consistent, we've sort of looked at that over, over a 30 year period. I should have mentioned we used a different epidemiological model uh, in this one. Um, which we, we've detailed in the, in the book, so quite a bit different to the um, banana case study, obviously quite a different, different pest. Um, so I think that's it for, for part B. So what um, Dave uh, also uh, showed you in those two case studies was, was that if you looked at our evaluation of the impacts, the benefits and the costs, in one case we agreed with the WTO's decision, and the other case we disagreed with it. So what, we're not trying to show that WTO messes it up every time, we're just saying if you do it properly, you might get one outcome or you might get the other. So in the case, 
in the case, the way the, uh, the book reads, that we supported the fire blight decision on apples, but we disagree with the, the salmon decision. So with part C, we change it away from uh, domestic uh, damage uh, to considering sort of wider environmental and social impacts of uh, trade. So we have, uh, and Janet looked, uh, put up a bunch of cases and we picked out two for the book. One is about um, uh, imports of tuna from Mexico into the US where the ecosystem service impact was the killing of dolphins in the catching of the, that tuna. And the second was uh, retreaded tires imported into Brazil from the EU where the consequence of those in, uh, in retreaded tyres was the uh, basically the dis early discarding of those tyres as uh, breeding grounds for mosquitoes in Brazil and basically uh, an increase in the number of deaths from yellow fever and okay, dengue you. fever. Okay. And so we then, and in each case, um, we use this sort of general framework where we'll, we've got a... Um, and, and we've got the one of them's the exporting country, the other's the importing country, and in each case there are uh, normal gains and trade impacts, but there are also these ecosystem service impacts, which are effectively externalities that are not taken account of in the normal calculation of trade benefits. And uh, we've drawn it in a way which makes it look like the ecosystem service impacts in one country and the other are similar, but in our case studies we identify um, in the case of, of uh, the retreaded tyres, discarded tyres in the EU don't breed mosquitoes because it's too friggin' cold for mosquitoes, but in Brazil you do get lots of mosquitoes, so you get very different. And the same, I think, the idea with the EUS tuna production is that they use different technologies so they don't damage the dolphin production in the same way. So we had to, so in, if David had been allowed to, he would have presented you with all the details of those two case studies and the, um, the way that we tried to evaluate the gains in trade on the one hand, but also the eco, the value, the ecosystem service impacts on the other. And we don't, those, are, that's a trickier thing to do because we're having to get uh, non-market values and insert them in. And so the, uh, the, the uh, case studies involve digging up numbers that we can just bung in. We're not, we're not going into the business of generating those numbers ourselves. We just pirate them and we say that if you're going to do it properly, you need to calculate these numbers. And in one case, we support the WTO's decision. In the other case, we oppose it. So we did the same sort of framework, really. And then, uh, so, there, so we, we believe that with parts B and C we have uh, demonstrated the, that uh, this is the way to, to take forward Janet's criticisms of the WTO process, make it a more of a proper evaluation of benefits and costs. And then we get, we get sort of, um, I'm going to flick through these. There's a retreaded tyre for you, look at that. And nasty mosquitoes. Um, get through all that and get through the tuna. We've probably got a picture of a dolphin here somewhere, Dave? No, no, no forget the dolphins. So you see, we just haven't got time for all this. So I um, don't know why part, D didn't have, part B didn't have a conclusion thing, but basically that's all right. It's the same idea. Oh, there. Part D. So part D is where we get uh, realistic and talk about the complications of doing getting lawyers to do things the way economists want to do them. But Dave, you can do that bit. All right, so yeah, as Rob was saying, we didn't, we didn't want this to be a book just bashing the WTO. Um, when you're talking about ecosystem services, um, complex systems, it's extremely hard uh, for any sort of um, regulator. But, so what we wanted to do was to put forward some solutions. So where do we go from here and how could this sort of possibly work? And we sort of um, got to thinking that in biosecurity space we deal with uncertainty. So the uncertainty about the ecosystem service impacts, for instance, you know, what's the, the value of a, of a dolphin that's affected by this um, purse-same uh, fishing method. Um, 
hugely, hugely complex, but we deal with this kind of thing all the time in biosecurity uh, when pests and diseases sort of come in. So two of the most obvious um, ones are in an import risk assessment, which uh, doesn't involve an analyst um, going through and putting a precise probability on the uh, risk of entry and establishment at each point of importation, right through from you know, picking a, a fruit in the exporting country right through to the consumer consuming it in the importing country. It's far more simplistic than that. So basically the analysts will go through, they have uh, six different risk categories, so ranging from negligible through to extreme. <coughs> they look at all the anecdotal sort of evidence, some quantitative, some qualitative, and they assign one of those categories. It has a rectangular distribution um, behind it, and essentially they look at all the, the processes, uh, all of the uh, stages of importation and then multiply them out, and that's your import risk assessment. So the, the point is that there are these categories, and their job is to choose which, uh, which category. Uh, they go in similar situation to, I don't know if people are familiar with our cost sharing agreements for animal and um, plant pests. So there's a cost sharing agreement in place um, for pests and diseases. If they're categorised under um, one of these agreements, it means that when they come in and if eradication is deemed economically feasible and technically feasible, then a share of the eradication costs is paid for by the main beneficiaries, so agricultural industries, and a certain percentage by the, the public. And that varies depending on, on the category. So um, when a pest or disease hasn't been observed in Australia previously, as, as many of them haven't, we're completely in the dark about these kind of categories. So people get together, there's this little categorisation committee, I think um, Plant Health Australia operates it of in years past, sort of sat on those, and basically lawyers will come in and economists and will sort of say our piece and then they make their determination of which, which category um, applies, which cost share category. So we suggest a similar situation might be set up for the dispute settlement panel. So if their job uh, was to determine the size of some sort of penalty, ecosystem service penalty, from a range of, of categories, we sort of theorise that that might um, streamline the, uh, the process. The, uh, just as a bit of a straw man that we've sort of put up there, we've sort of given one example of how this penalty might work. So we've just, if we call it the penalty alpha, it's essentially the way we've modelled it in the, in the book. It uses the multilateral gains from trade uh, as uh, something you can, you can quantify. So we can get consumer and producer surplus. That's definitely something we can quantify. And out of that, we're trying to work out, we're sort of using that and a weight attached to that to try and work out, are the ecosystem service impacts, the multilateral ecosystem service impacts of trade bigger or smaller than those gains from trade? And uh, so we, we've come up with the semi-quantitative categories, again, much like the import risk assessment, much like the emergency um, plant pests and animal pest uh, cost sharing deeds. But here we've got a range of penalties ranging from uh, 1.5 down to negative uh, 1.5. So when we talk about a positive uh, penalty, it means that the trade involves high ecosystem service costs. When we're talking about something at the opposite end of the scale, like minus 1.5, it's, it's the opposite. So trade actually promotes um, ecosystem service uh, benefits. So the, the penalty can be either positive or negative. And in the book, we identify sort of six possible cases, um, which, uh, sorry, I've got returning, because I thought we'd, we'd sort of have a bit more time to, uh, <laughs> to talk about those. Um, six possible scenarios uh, with gains from trade and ecosystem service impacts and which penalties may, may or may not apply. So in the first case, uh, looking at, at uh, trade, there may be a case where the gains from trade are positive and the ecosystem service impacts are positive, in which case both of those are sort of working together. So the penalty is more or less not, not, um, not needed. So. Um, but if we choose one, you know, you're looking at in the order of um, uh, minus uh, 0.5 to minus 1.5 because the ecosystem service impacts um, have been uh, positive. Um, in the second case, but basically, so that the trade can get through on the, the gains from trade, the multilateral gains from trade, 
uh, anyway. In the second case, the multilateral gains from trade are negative, and so too are the ecosystem service impacts. So in this case, once again, they're sort of both working together. If you just look at the trade in, in isolation, if, if the trade impacts are negative and ecosystem service impacts just exacerbate the fact, then you know, your, your penalty is either very, very high, so 1.5 or moderately high at, um, at 0.5. Now it sort of gets tricky. So in the third case, there might be a situation where the gains from trade are positive, the ecosystem service impacts are negative, but the uh, gains from trade outweigh the ecosystem service impacts. Easy enough to, to sort of say, but proving that might be very, very difficult. So we would anticipate that these kind of things are some of the edgy uh, case studies. But um, if it could be proven that this was the case, a, a moderate uh, cost penalty uh, may be appropriate. Fourth case, similarly uh, quite a tricky one, so still got positive gains from trade and still got negative ecosystem service impacts. However, this time the ecosystem service impacts are greater than the, uh, the gains from trade. Um, so we would assume that a high cost penalty is appropriate. Once again, quite, quite tricky to sort of prove that. And uh, so second to last one, we've got a, an instance where gains from trade are negative, positive ecosystem service uh, impacts, and uh, the, um, the ecosystem service impacts aren't um, as large as the, uh, the gains from trade, uh, so a low cost penalty uh, may be appropriate. So once again, the, the gains from trade uh, are negative, so the trade uh, situation sort of rules out the ecosystem service impacts aren't large enough to overcome those gains from trade. And finally, when uh, gains from trade are still negative, ecosystem service is positive, but this time the ecosystem service impacts override the gains from trade, then we're sort of suggesting that a, uh, a very low penalty, so uh, minus 1.5, so it might be appropriate. So just looking at these, these six different cases, we sort of go through um, the book how the panel might go about um, attributing or, or, or categorising um, the trade according to, to our little um, ecosystem service penalty. And again, it's not that dissimilar to processes that we already use to account for uncertainty in biosecurity. So um, once again, it's a bit of a straw man. We just sort of wanted to put a bit of a, a solution um, uh, and it'll be interesting to see if and what sort of traction we, we get with that. Did you want to do a roundup, Rob, or will we just leave it there and Pass over to questions. I think I will probably do actually. Uh, All right. It's a good way to finish. All right. Yeah, okay. But with that, yeah, thanks very much for coming. Sorry that was a bit uh, cut short. All the interesting case studies were cut out. Thanks, Rob. Um, so, you had to invite questions, so we've got 10 minutes.